New Mexico's centennial statehood celebration is drawing to a close. Of course, our state has a history much longer than that, as author David Holtby found out when he sat down to write a history of New Mexico's quest to join the Union. Even our battle to become a state has a lengthy history. His NMAF producer, Matt Grubbs. David Holtby, thanks for coming in. Pleasure uh, to be here, Matt. Why was our 47th star such a hard one, uh, both for us and for the rest of the Union? Starting in 1848, when after the war with Mexico, the United States acquired the Southwest, we had to go through three periods of struggle. One had to do with national events, slavery and then immigration. And we got caught up in debates about and in contention over those two issues. By about the turn of the century, of course, those had, the Civil War had quieted in 1865, immigration had uh, continued, but had really been resolved in most people's minds that yes, we will have many, many foreigners. About 20% of the nation's population in 1900 were, were immigrants. Second issue then, political contentions. Democrats were on the rise, and in the 1890s, uh, they had Grover Cleveland return as a Democratic president. Only uh, Grover Cleveland, between the Civil War and 1912, uh, was a Democrat as president. But Republicans could see the trend, and they were very fearful of this. And new states represented new votes, particularly in the Senate. And this was a threat to uh, several uh, very powerful senators. And their agent for blocking this became a man uh, notorious in New Mexico, uh, Senator Albert Beveridge from Indiana. Okay. That eventually quieted down about 1910. But in the meantime, between about 1900 and 1909, New Mexicans themselves managed to complicate their own case through uh, fraud and deceit uh, and just internal factionalism that uh, gave people great pause. So by the time statehood arrived, each of these issues had, had been resolved, but uh, there were a series of uh, conflicts that took a while to work out. And so I'm, I'm laughing because I'm sure no one would recognize any of the things you just spoke of, right? <laughs> it is often said that uh, the past is prologue and <laughs> When in 1907, 8, and 9, federal investigations, a number of them were conducted in New Mexico over particularly land fraud. I'm writing about this in 2009 and 10, and it's like the headlines have been ripped from <laughs> a century before. Sure. Uh, yes, there are a lot of, of antecedents. And, and one of the points of the book is uh, for people today to understand how we arrived at where we are, what are the issues, and how did these uh, play out a century and more ago? Uh, and many of them we still grapple with, uh, certainly uh, economic development, uh, some civil rights issues, uh, say over immigration. Absolutely. We have in our state uh, enormous concern, as we should, over the distribution of land and water uh, and wise resource use all major issues uh, in the period uh, before and just after statehood. And our relationship to the federal government has, has always been a very um, tight one, but it sounds like it was, was it a little bit different um, at the inception of our statehood? It was different in that the federal government had uh, a very unified and clear policy for pushing uh, what today we call the conservation movement. So under President Theodore Roosevelt between 1901 and 1909, New Mexico became one of several areas where an enormous amount of uh, public land was taken back by the federal government uh, to the tune of over 30 million acres. Uh -huh. Much of this was carved out of former land grants and it was done through decisions uh, in the late 19th century by the U.S. Supreme Court. But the fundamental difference in the relation with the federal government was um, an issue that, that echoes today. The states' rights argument was very strongly advanced by New Mexico. They wanted complete control over all the land and resources, and the federal government said no. 
uh, and, and this complicated matters. And things were done illegally, which is why there were federal investigations over okay. land issues. But the states' rights argument uh, uh, echoes today. Uh, it's, it's essentially what uh, Tea Party and, uh, and those um, like-minded elements uh, sure. advocate, that the states have certain rights. And we know what the Constitution says, that those things not specifically allocated to the federal government are yeah. reserved to the states. What does that mean? We still struggle with that. Very large issue in the period before statehood, too. Absolutely. Uh, the period before statehood, um, you mentioned sort of moving from the Civil War, um, post-Civil War, um, all the way through to 1912. How long was there an active push for statehood? I mean, were there people mm -hmm. gunning for it already? It, it was somewhat, if you were to graph it, you would see peaks and valleys. Okay. So in 1850, we almost secured it, but it slipped away for a number of reasons that I explain in the book. Uh, then things were somewhat quiet. The few months before the Civil War, President Lincoln, and this is something that historians uh, have, have recently been working on, President Lincoln actually endorsed slavery in New Mexico as uh, president-elect Lincoln endorsed slavery as a way to perhaps forestall what was clearly going to happen. Huh. Uh, he had this position for several months. By the time he uh, took the oath of office in, uh, 19, in 1861, he had abandoned that position. But they were desperate. They were trying to keep the Union together New Mexico was adamantly opposed to black slavery. It was also a position that in Mexico, uh, they had abolished slavery before we were ever part of the United States. So it was nothing in the ethic here to do that. Then things were quiet until 1875. We almost made it again, but lost it uh, for um, an indiscretion by our delegate. Then things were quiet until the late 1880s, and six other states came in and we were left uh, at the altar, if you will. Uh, that really got people's attention in New Mexico. We had not done as other states had. We had not lobbied. We had not really pressed our case. And so in the 1890s, from there on, and, and that's the major thrust of my book, from the 1890s uh, forward, uh, very concerted efforts to secure statehood. And, and in all sorts of ways that maybe people wouldn't think of, both in the uh, Nuevo Mexicano community and in the Euro-American community. Uh, and even, uh, as I relate, uh, in the Native American community, they wanted statehood uh, as a sure way to protect themselves from the state's rights advocates who, uh, who had begun to wage quite a campaign against their land holdings. They wanted those lands as well. So much of it's still about land and water at that, yeah. at that point. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so often, um, the engaging histories that we read, um, they center on some characters, some people that we can relate to or we can love or hate, you know? Um, who, who were those people that, as you went back over this um, and found them, really thought, oh, boy, this is, a, this is yes. a part of the story that needs to be told? That's, thank you for that question. That, that, <laughs> that is how I structured the book. There, each chapter, and there are nine, centers on one of these um, either scoundrels or one of these people of great complexity uh, is how I prefer to see them. Uh, I begin with uh, Thomas Ketron, who is also our delegate, who also was the attorney in the um, cases decided by the Supreme Court, one of the attorneys, that took away uh, the 30 million acres land from land yeah. grants. Um, there are some notable Nuevo Mexicanos, uh, and I profile several of these. They were all journalists. Uh, a man named Nestor Montoya uh, is one of my uh, um, most admired, and so I, I profile him quite a bit. He, in the early 1920s, became our U.S. representative uh, and then tragically died, uh, so could not you know, uh, continue his political career. Sure. But each chapter, so we have... Um, the ever notorious Albert Beveridge. Uh, we have President Theodore Roosevelt, uh, and before him a little bit President McKinley. Um, our two delegates to Congress, um, um, Bernard Rohde and uh, William Bull, as he was called, Andrews. Uh, each of these figure prominently. The man who led the federal investigations for the Department of Justice, a very obscure figure until I discovered he had once done a 57-page history 
of this period in his life, which is at Columbia University, a man named Ormsby McHarge. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Albert Fall, uh, and finally, uh, President Taft. Uh, and there are a whole cast of secondary characters. But by organizing it around people and their stories, uh, I can get into something of the complexity of, of their motives. I really want people to understand uh, that while these were often seen as self-serving individuals, and that was true, uh, they did it for very compelling reasons uh, and felt that this was uh, in the best interest. Uh, and, and that level of, it's not black and white, uh, right. it's, it's largely series of grays. And so the best way to do that is through stories. Uh, sure. Well, and you talk about sort of this ebb and flow of, of how close we came to statehood um, prior to that. And, and it's interesting just how reliant history can be on the actions or choices of, of a few folks um, Absolutely. when they come to light. Absolutely. One of the, the great surprises to me, and, and uh, when I started the book, I was going to study Albert Beveridge. I thought I knew the story. Within about a day or two, I realized that I didn't know anything about this <laughs> true story. There were majorities in both the House of Representatives and the Senate favoring statehood, but they could not get past the roadblock that Albert Beveridge. And I thought, well, how could a man who's been in the Senate only two or three years wield such power? Well, then I discovered the power behind him, the heavyweight who uh, was able to maneuver Beveridge. Beveridge became the puppet for um, a senator from Rhode Island by the name of Nelson Aldrich. Unknown, largely forgotten today, although he's the namesake for uh, Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller, ah, yes. former, pres former vice president under uh, President Ford. Um, but he wielded the real power. They had no Senate majority leader at that time, but okay. he filled that role. He um, got what he wanted and he blocked what he did not. And he did not want statehood because he thought it a great threat to his um, ability to maneuver and manipulate the Senate. Uh, and so when I realized that, oh, that conventional wisdom doesn't hold, I was reminded that often it's spoken of as the ABCs of history. A is for archival sources. Uh, they're, they're, they're essential. B is for be wary of conventional wisdom. Okay. And C, consider all points of view. And, and that's what I try to do. So, so I I tried to understand Aldrich and Beveridge and all of the other. Um, I, I think I do pretty well there. Albert Fall, I still do. I just think he was a scoundrel. I'm sorry. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, it's, it's a readable book, and it's nice to know that you have more things planned. I do. Um, about our great state, and so we just appreciate your time. Thanks for coming in, David. Thank you very much, Matt.